As had become a tradition by now, I'm going to upload this video on my main channel for 24 hours, then I'm going to remove it from there and upload it on this channel. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning, and today we're going to discuss the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The two-state so-called solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, now promoted aggressively by both the United States and the European Union, is a counterfactual pipe dream. It's delusional. It will never ever materialize. But many actors have a vested interest in promoting this sideshow, thus diverting attention from the real issue at stake. And the real issue is the mutually exclusive claims of Israelis and Palestinians to the same piece of territory, from the river, Jordan, to the sea, the Mediterranean. Conflicting narratives which exclude each other and can never ever be reconciled, contradictory as they are. History teaches us that such persistent entitlement usually results in genocidal ethnic cleansing of one type or another. Attempts to divide the indivisible among the parties to this intractable 140 years old conflict, such attempts date back almost a century. A kaleidoscope of declarations, delegations, committees, plans, programs and resolutions during this protracted period. All of these led nowhere but to increasing bloodshed in a series of skirmishes and outright wars. The Palestinians purposefully maintain the only leverage they possess. Their partly self-inflicted victimhood, the refugee status, now in its whopping 75th anniversary. The third and fourth generations are still refugees. Lacking a standing army, Palestinians resort to atrocious terrorism time and again. Israel, in the meantime, has expanded its presence in the disputed territories and has devolved into committing war crimes habitually. A cursory look at the map tells why, tells the story, recounts it. The Palestinians are shoehorned into two non-contiguous land masses. Linking these hyper-dense enclaves above or under the ground would bisect Israel, cut it in two, and render Israel a hostage to many returns of October 7th. This is, of course, a non-starter, and yet there's no other way to create a Palestinian state. The Hamas the most popular political faction among Palestinians, is committed to the annihilation of Israel. Pragmatic truces ad interim notwithstanding. The Hamas represents the surge of belligerent and anti-Western Islamism that gripped both Sunnis and Shia across the world. Israel is perceived as a colonial outpost of settlers, a replay of the Crusades in lands that by right and by might belong to Muslims. Israel, with some justification, perceives an accommodation with the Palestinians as a lost cause, having witnessed their interlocutors rebuff and trample on the olive branches that Israel had extended multiple times since the Oslo Accords. Both parties are now firmly entrenched in an all-or-nothing, zero-sum zero -sum game mindset. And this is not conducive to a deal, of course. But the problem is this. Time is not on Israel's side. Palestinian birth rates are far higher than Jewish ones. Ubiquitous age-old anti-Semitism has now transformed and transmogrified into anti-Zionism and anti-Israelism. Democratized weapons technologies have rendered terrorist organizations in asymmetrical warfare all but unbeatable. Israelis argue among themselves whether the Jewishness of Israel should outweigh its democratic nature. 
whether, there is, whether Israel should sacrifice democracy just to remain Jewish or sacrifice its Jewishness to maintain democracy. But this is a delusional and solipsistic debate. Israel cannot remain Jewish for much longer, even if it were to sacrifice the rule of law and adopt apartheid and genocide combined as policies. Moreover, Israel is a paper tiger, a public, a public relations exercise. Israel is not self-sufficient, as we see now during the, the war in Gaza. Israel's army is comparable to the Russian army, not to the American army. The IDF, Israel Defense Force, is a mere glorified militia with an air force, one of many militias in a region overflowing with paramilitary formations. Israel's doomsday show off nuclear weapons are no more relevant and no more useful than North Korea's, Iran's or Pakistan's. <laughs> in the wake of an armed insurgency, North Macedonia is now ruled by an Albanian prime minister with multiple government ministries in the hands of the hitherto much reviled minority. North Macedonia's foreign minister, the polylog medical doctor Buyao Osmani, is arguably the most eloquent and educated representative abroad the country has ever, has ever had. I hope that Israel is heading the same way a one-state solution. The day Israel has a Palestinian prime minister and a Palestinian foreign minister, Hamas and its ilk are doomed. They're doomed. <laughs> Terrorism would vanish overnight and a much needed peace will have been restored all over the prosperous and proud this tortured land. Israel, also known as Palestine. The Palestinians call it Nakba, a catastrophe. The Jews call it the War of Independence. Today's video deals with the lies, propaganda, myths, deliberate misinformation, fake news, not today, but 75 years ago, during the conflict between the Jewish Yishuv and the Palestinian indigenous population in what today is the State of Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip, well into the Sinai Desert. This is a video that is off topic on my main channel, so I'm going to leave it there for 24 hours. Following these 24 hours, I'm going to delete it and re-upload it to my other channel, Vaknin Musings. Vaknin Musings, one word, is my channel for political, geopolitical and economic issues. So, at your request, here is fact-checking the Nakba. Nakba or Independence War. Fact-checking the year, the momentous year of 1948. My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. <coughs> As with every protracted conflict, both the Israelis and the Palestinians spew out counterfactual propaganda regarding the events that have led to the crisis of Palestinian refugees. More precisely, by the way, internally displaced people IDPs, because the vast majority of Palestinians who were dislocated simply moved within the territory of, at the time, Palestine. All these events took place between 1947 and 1949. And here are the facts, some of the more pertinent facts, at least. Number one, the Jews owned 6% of the land of Palestine prior to 1947. Another 49% was owned by the state. The Ottoman authorities succeeded by the British mandate. 22% was owned directly by Arab Palestinian farmers, 
villages, peasants, felahin, small small landholders. Felahin were actually tenant tenant farmers, but some of them acquired land. And finally, 23% of the land was owned by rich Arabs, colloquially known as Effendis, most of them from outside Palestine, actually. These Effendis lived in Beirut or Cairo or Damascus and rented out, leased their property, their land holdings, sometimes to the Jews, actually. But still, the disparity is pretty shocking. The Jews owned 6%, the Arabs owned 45%, and 49% was owned by the state. The United, state, the United Nations Partition Resolution, Resolution number 181, gave the Jews 55% of Palestine, although most of it comprised of the Negev Desert. The new Jewish state was supposed to incorporate 450,000 Arabs and 650,000 Jews within its borders, a one-state solution. The Jews agreed to it because they anticipated mass waves of immigration, which would rectify this demographic threat. Number two, the Jews constituted a majority in Jerusalem, in Tiberias, and believe it or not, in Haifa, prior to 1948. Yes, these were majority Jewish cities. Safad, Sfat, and Jaffa were almost entirely Arab. Prior to 1881 and the beginning of the Jewish settlement in Palestine, Palestine's population consisted of 450,000 Arabs, including immigrants from Syria, Lebanon, and North Africa, known as, known as Maghrabis, and 20,000 Jews. 450,000 Arabs and 20,000 Jews in 1881, when it all started. Number three, the idea of displa displacement or transfer, ethnic cleansing of the indigenous Arab population to Transjordan or to some other Arab countries, this idea was never uh, an official policy of the Jewish Yishuv. It was never a part of any overall military strategy. But ethnic cleansing transfer was widely thought by the Zionists to be a desirable, non-coercive and just solution to the inter-ethnic conflict, a conflict that has been taking place since 1882. Similar transfers have taken place all over the world, especially in the wake of the Second World War, and they resulted in amicable relations, for example, between Greece, Bulgaria and Turkey, as well as Czechoslovakia and post-Nazi Germany. Number four, the Jews have accepted the United Nations Partition Resolution. The Arabs, including volunteers from abroad, have rejected it, and they are the ones who embarked on hostilities against the Jewish settlements and supply convoys. Later on, regular Arab armies from several countries invaded the territory of Palestine that should have become the Jewish state, according to the partition resolution. So there's no debate as to who started the war. Number five, between November 1947 and April 1948, about, I'm sorry, between November 1947 and April 1949, about 400 to 700,000 Palestinian Arabs, no one knows the exact number, some scholars say 600,000, some scholars minimize and say 400 to 500,000, and some scholars exceed this number, especially Arab scholars, and they believe the number has been closer to 700,000. These Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, left their homes and became internally displaced within the territory of Palestine. Only a small fraction of these Arabs returned to their abandoned, ruined and looted villages. In 1950, the State of Israel ended up having 
150,000 Arab citizens to 700,000 Jews. A sizable minority of the upper middle class and the affluent Arab, Palestinian Arabs emigrated to Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and Transjordan. Number six, most of these refugees, about 80% of them, were not expelled by force. Though Plan D of the Haganah, the Haganah was the, the antecedent of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. The Haganah was the main military body of the Yishuv and later on became the Israeli Defense Force. So the Haganah had something called Plan D. And the Haganah's Plan D called for the expulsion of Arabs from villages abetting important traffic arteries, uh, the new state's borders, and major Jewish majority cities. In some locales, such as Haifa, the nascent Jewish authorities actually tried to halt the Arabs from, from fleeing. Many other villages, though, were forcibly evacuated at the local initiative of Haganah commanders, IZL and Lehi commanders in the field. So, it's a mixed picture. Only 20% of Palestinian Arabs have been forcibly expelled at the point of a gun. That much is true. But it is equally true that the Haganah, later Israeli Defense Force, had a plan in place, Plan D, calling for the expulsion and evacuation of Arab farmers, villagers, tenants, and peasants in specific, in highly specific locations, next to traffic um, arteries, on the borders, next to major Israeli uh, Jewish cities. Number seven, the exodus of Palestinian Arabs was mostly voluntary. As we said, 80% of them left of their own will. What was the motivation? Why, was, why would someone so close to the soil someone whose life depends on his piece of land. Why would he abandon that and his home and all his property? Why would he leave all these behind voluntarily, not by force, not by coercion, not at the point of a gun? Why did so many of them, about half a million, why did they go this route? There are several reasons. A. Rumors of egregious atrocities murders, massacres, and rapes committed by, mostly by, extremist Jewish paramilitary organizations such as Essel, IZL, and Lehi, LHI. For example, in the friendly and peaceful hamlet of Deir Yassin, there was persistent looting by all, all the various Jewish military formations Haganah included. So these were not false rumors. These were not fake news. These cases really happened, and quite a few of them actually. And the Arab, the Palestinian Arabs who were exposed to information about these atrocities, they got terrified and they fled. Reason number two, in order of importance, by the way. Reason number two, the influx of marauding Arab fighters, mainly from Iraq. These volunteers resorted to blackmailing the peasants, looting and summarily dispensing with their opponents, killing them, assassinating, taking over abandoned property with alacrity and glee. So many of these volunteers drove away the Arab population in order to enrich themselves and in order to establish military positions in the abandoned houses. Reason number three, recurrent calls by Arab leaders, local and foreign, to evacuate children, women, and the elderly from the battle zones. But I must emphasize, there were very rare, very rare instructions and guidance to evacuate able-bodied men capable of fighting. These were mostly urged and instructed to stay behind 
until Arab victory had been secured and to fight to fight the Jewish population. So it is true that Arab leaders called <clears throat> for the evacuation of Arab settlements and Arab villages and even Arab towns. All this is true, but it is not true that they called for a mass exodus of all Arabs. They were discriminating. The Arab leaders called on men, especially young men, to stay behind and fight. Reason number four, the withdrawal of the British administration in May 1948 from the territory of the mandate has meant that many of the remaining Arabs would have needed to accede to Jewish rule or possibly even worse, the domination of the clique of the Mufti Husseini. Husseini was at the time staying in Egypt, having supported the Nazis during World War II, and he was known to be murderous. The Husseini clan have assassinated numerous Arab leaders who have opposed his rule. In 1936-1939, Husseini and his extended family have established a rule of terror all over Palestine, and people still remembered it. So there was a lot of fear. The Arab leaders initially considered the refugees a propaganda asset. They thought they can leverage the refugees to change public opinion and to exert pressure on Israel, on the state of Israel that was emerging or on the Jewish Yishuv. But even the Arab leaders were taken aback and overwhelmed, terrified by the sight of the mass exodus from the territory of Palestine. The Jews were at first shocked beyond belief. They didn't know what to do. Some of them tried to stop the refugees from going away. Some of them encouraged the refugees. There was confusion in the Jewish camp as well, because no one has anticipated the uh, Arabs, the Palestinian Arab exodus and the Arabs fleeing in such massive numbers. An example in case is Haifa. But when the Jews began to realize the magnitude and ubiquity of the Arab flight, they understood that it's a historical chance to establish an ethnically pure state, a Jewish state, with a very minimal Arab minority. And henceforth, they either um, took a hands-off approach and let the Arabs depart, or they encouraged the Arabs in a variety of ways, by spreading rumors and gossip, and as I said, in accordance with Plan D, about 20% of the Arab population were expelled forcibly. And so I think the reigning, the reigning sentiment of the era was not premeditated malice, some long range or long term vision, some prepared and premeditated and promulgated ethnic cleansing campaign but improvisation, confusion, uh, incoherence on both sides, the Jews and the Arabs, when it came to the emerging Arab refugee crisis. Point number eight, once Arab tenants and farmers have left, the State of Israel and the Israeli Defense Force never allowed these people to return and reclaim their property. If any of them did infiltrate back, they were expelled to the point of a gun. Number nine, the Arab states were very reluctant to accommodate the influx of Palestinian refugees. And they committed only insignificant forces to the invasion of Palestine in May 1948. They were very half-hearted about the situation, similar to what's happening today. The militias, the local villagers called them foreigners, were riffraff 
badly trained and no match for the Jewish forces, 28,000 of which served in the British army during World War II. Arab society was fragmented and institutionally dysfunctional, with an abyss between town and country, rich and poor, landowners and impoverished tenants, Christians and Muslims, the educated, the illiterate, the pro Hussainis and their enemies. The Arab society was totally torn apart. There was no hint of central policy or guidance from anywhere. Numbers of fighters on both sides was at all times during the war largely equal, and the Arabs had the advantage of having tanks and air force. But quantity never translated to quality on the Arab side. These are the facts. And if I succeed to infuriate both parties to the conflict, it means I've done a good job and have remained as objective and neutral as I could be. Thank you for listening.